July 1st, 1598. Many of the Spanish soldiers were rushing over to these garitas, these sentries here in beautiful old San Juan in San Felipe de Morro, which is one of the larger Spanish fortification systems in the entire New World. And they were rushing right inside in order to catch sight of the English that were coming here. Because the English that were invading was Sir George Clifford, who was the Earl of Cumberland. And he was arriving in the distance in order to capture this gateway to the Caribbean. This, ladies and gentlemen, is Puerto Rico. And right now we are at El Morro, which is uh, one of the two main forts you can visit here in Old San Juan. Right there, where we're cameras facing is the city of Old San Juan, the second oldest city in the Western Hemisphere post-European colonization. Uh, it dates up back all the way to 1521 to the time of Juan Ponce de Leon, who decided to evade the mosquitoes of Caparra, which was further into Puerto Rico, and come settle here upon the rock that is this little island, Islote, of Old San Juan in order to set up a harbor and a base here in order to provide the Spaniards with a place to continue their conquest all around the Americas. And it proved to be successful for the Spanish Empire for quite a while. So today we're going to explore the upper part of El Morro. And I'm going to show you a little bit of the views. Uh, Alicia says it's windy. Oh yes. And let's go inside here. So these are one of the garitas. I think this is probably one of the more pleasant garitas to stand in because a lot of the garitas means a century and um, some of them are a little bit more dingier. <laughs> but this one, I think, is the touristy one that everyone uh, stands in and takes a photo of. Uh, but this is where watchmen would stand uh, or long shooters, long riflemen would stand in order to shoot anyone down that is approaching. There has been only really three major attacks upon Old San Juan that were too close to call uh, for Puerto Rico and one of them was successful. The, fir the first one was 1598 with Sir George Clifford, Earl of Cumberland, who actually ended up taking this fort. However, this army of British soldiers, this navy of British soldiers, the food that they were bringing along in order to have sustenance, in order to battle, end up going bad. And they all started getting dysentery, suffering from fever, convulsions, even worse, death. So the British could not stay if they couldn't find food because they could not sustain this uh, group of soldiers or navy men to go further into the island, so they left. Puerto Rico was this close to not being called Puerto Rico, but more so rich port. Yep, just like that city in Connecticut. But that didn't happen. The British, the British left. Then another time later on, the Dutch came and the Dutch actually managed to come all the way over here to Old San Juan and burn it down. Some of those older buildings were no longer around. Then the third invasion, I'll tell you a little bit more because now we have a line of people gathering waiting to see the Garita. Let me know if you know the third major invasion of Puerto Rico. So here is the views from La Garita. <laughs> I would stick my camera out, but it is too windy, so I won't be taking that risk. But it's gorgeous views, as you can see. So welcome, welcome everyone. Hello, Alicia. Hello everyone, nice to see you here. So a lot of people are saying they, they already know who was, who's the third invasion. Ron got it correct, the third uh, <laughs> The reggaeton has been an invasion, a Puerto Rican invasion upon the lands of America. But the third invasion, it's right here. The flag right there. 
that was the United States of America. They wanted a hold on Caribbean trade and also to provide a base in order to protect Puerto Rico, uh, to protect the mainland U.S. from any invasion. A lot of people frame the Spanish-American War as Ameri purely American business interest. And while business interests were involved because the sugar trade in Puerto Rico was moving on up after the coffee trade was moving on up, but sugar ended up becoming increasingly important, even more so than coffee at some point, uh, because it provided a lot of benefits for um, confectionaries at chocolate production, coffee itself in order to uh, sweeten coffee beans that weren't the most optimal. And then there was a whole host of other applications which people can let me know in the comments. Uh, and then enjoy and grow. But the other interest was military power and military deterrence. The thing is, this area of Puerto Rico and the island itself is the gateway to the Caribbean. If you hold Puerto Rico, you hold the Caribbean. If you hold the Caribbean, you protect the mainland of the US. And Americans wanted to do that. But why? Who would have attacked America at that time? Well, a little unknown part of history was that the Germans actually wanted to take control of the Caribbean. They wanted to come here. And if they got Puerto Rico or any of the other islands like Cuba or Dominican Republic, it would have made the entire situation here in North America way more trickier. And of course, there was other European interests here as well. So America decided to move in. So it's a very complicated history. But in 1890, bombarding the city of San Juan, not that many people died, though. It was only about five civilians and four soldiers. America ended up taking over the island, special designation. So that's why to this day we have three flags here. That first flag that you see on the left, that is the Cross of Burgundy, which is paying homage to the flag that has been, that was so far in its modern history standing for the longest time, which is the Spaniards. So that's the Spaniard flag, the Cross of Burgundy, because Burgundy was a holding of the Spanish Empire for quite a while. And then in the middle, we have the Puerto Rican flag, which was developed, as far as I know, in the late 1800s, early 1900s. It, that's why it looks very similar to the Cuban flag and also shares similar colors to the Dominican Republic flag as well. And then at the end, we have the American flag showing 50 stars at the moment because Puerto Rico never ended up becoming a state. While the U.S. held Puerto Rico, uh, Hawaii and Alaska both became states. Well, Alaska became a state a little bit earlier, but Hawaii became a state. Purple Queen, nice to see you here. Susie says, que bonito la bandera. Yes, it is beautiful. Beautiful flag, definitely. And here we have a helicopter passing by. I'm not sure, if, maybe this is a sightseeing helicopter. Damaris, bienvenidos. Welcome, welcome everyone. If you're a new viewer, do let me know. If you're tuning in, say hello. Let me know where we're watching from. Uh, when did people from China and India come to the Caribbean? So Puerto Rico, more so than other nearby Latin American countries like Dominican Republic and Cuba, had a huge influx of Europeans coming in but also Chinese. Uh, the Chinese, as far as I know, came in for the railroad, uh, which were, I assume, were built around the 1880s, 1890s, maybe a little bit after the American invasion, so uh, 1900. So Chinese came for that, as far as I know. But there was a whole host of other immigrants because shortly before the Spanish-American War, this was not really that populated of an island and the Spaniards wanted to fill it up and wanted to 
cultivate more of the lands within the interior of the country. So they posted all around Europe saying, hey, if you're Catholic, you can come here and get a free piece of land or something very cheap, which you can cultivate, grow and sell those goods. So many people end up coming here from Ireland, uh, parts of Germany and other parts uh, like um, Curaçao, uh, there was also other islands in like Sardinia, Italy, um, and then also some Czech uh, people from for, uh, nowadays Czech Republic. So there was there was a quite a bit of a variety of people that came here. So Puerto Rican heritage is not so clear cut as people sometimes make it seem to be. And you and let me show you more of the views. Scots also come here. Uh. Hey, Ismael says, watching from Alabama, pero soy boricua. Ah, que bien, que está viendo. Esta emisión, también soy fluido en español. Puedes preguntar cualquier cosa que quieres. Anne Marie Santiago, buen día. Danette, nice to see you here. Hello, Kay. Hello, Betty. Hello, Andrea from Germany. Guten Tag. Germans also end up coming to the island of Puerto Rico. So uh, the German Empire at that time never decided to, did not uh, succeed in launching any attacks on the Caribbean. They end up getting some holdings, I think, in Africa. So that, that part of history is very interesting. But German immigrants indeed did come to Puerto Rico and they came a lot to an area called Santurce, which is right by old San Juan, about a 15 minute drive away. And um, as far as I know, a lot of them set up clothing shops and textiles and garments, as far as I know. Joe says, uh, there's still some parts of Puerto Rico that still have a lot of Dutch. You know, I, I don't think so. I'm not sure if the Dutch ever came here. Uh, because the Spaniards were really only allowed uh, Catholics. Uh, they did not want Protestants to come into the country. And then as for Americans, uh, anyone who could immigrate to America could technically come to Puerto Rico, as far as I know. Steph says, don't forget to grab the Limber today. <laughs> yeah, the Limber, the, the famous drink. All right, let me zoom in here to show you more of the protected harbor because today we can see how the harbor is protected. This is why old San Juan and nearby Cataño is a perfect location for a harbor because a harbor needs to both have deep waters so you can land bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger ships and have industry. You have to have pretty much wide open space. You can't have huge cliff sides because if you have huge cliff sides, it makes industry way harder. So Puerto Rico has those two things. It's deep waters and land that you can build on, especially big industry. And then the other thing is, and harbors and piers and slips and things like that. And then the other thing is, it's a military advantage. Since it's protected, if uh, we have attacks, say from the British, which happened, you can prevent any naval attacks, any Navy ships from coming in because you have a bottleneck. Gwen says, thank you so much for the fort. Do I need a visa to visit the uh, PR? No, if, if you have a visa to visit the US, you don't need a visa to come to Puerto Rico. You just need a visa to the US. Now, I would recommend checking uh, directly the rules as, as to coming directly to Puerto Rico. But from my understanding, a visa to the US is a visa to Puerto Rico. They're not different. If you're an American citizen, you can come into Puerto Rico with just a driver's license so far. That, that's, of course, subject to change. Uh, but yes, all you need is a driver's license. You don't need a passport. Did any uh, confederados uh, settle here after the American Civil War? 
Mark, I don't know. That's a great question. I would doubt it. So the American Civil War happened in the 1860s, uh, and those gentlemen had business interests, and they were interested also in maintaining slavery uh, in order to have free labor, not cheap labor, but basically free labor, labor or labor that they had to pay for only once. Uh, I don't think Puerto Rico would have been too conducive for them to come afterwards. Uh, the, as far as I know, Puerto Rico had outlawed slavery by that time. Uh, and then the Spaniards did that, I think, quite a while uh, before the American Civil War. The only place that had slavery after American abolished slavery in the, in the 1860s, 1870s, was Brazil, which was the late 1890s. And th this is the new world, this is the, the Americas. Uh, the history of, of that aspect of, of uh, labor and slavery is different in other parts of the world. Hey, Noble Lama says, uh, I've been in line locked areas for most of my life, so seeing this in person uh, would be amazing. Oh, yeah, I hope you come. Yeah, definitely. You know, uh, Emery, I mean, uh, hey, Noble Lama, let me know where you're watching from, but I hope you end up coming, if you, if, especially if you're based in the U.S. Uh, once you have access to one of the major airports, like Atlanta, Miami, Orlando, JFK, Newark, it's it's not that expensive to come over here. Anne Marie says, I'm proud you are Puerto Rican. I followed you because of your interesting approach. Adiba Boricua. <laughs> Thank you so much. Boricua means uh, Puerto Rican. It's derived from the indigenous name of the island, which is Borinquen. Roy, he say hola, hola. Gwen, welcome. Steven Chow from San Francisco Bay Area, man. Hey, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, hey, thank you so much for reminding me the other... Uh, sorry, I said Curaçao by mistake earlier today. Uh, I meant Corsican, Corsican, Corsican were the, uh, a large portion of the immigrants that came here. So whenever you see like a French-sounding last name in Puerto Rico, there's a good chance they were Corsican. I said Curaçao by mistake earlier. Corsican. So, for example, the first female mayor in Puerto Rico, her last name was Gautier. I would bet she had Corsican descend descendants. Oleg says, my God, what beauty is around. God save this world. Yeah, that's gorgeous beauty. The best view of El Moro is from water level, uh, where the people would have seen it coming onto the island. Yeah, I can only imagine. I haven't had the chance to see that view in my life yet, actually. That would be amazing. I, I wish Puerto Rico had more boat tours. I gotta check if there's boat tours now here. John says, this video is an easy like. Nebul says, Corsican as from Corsica. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, modern day. Corsica is part of modern day France, if I'm correct. So yeah. Okay, let me know if you see me and hear me once again. Here we have what was a addition made a little bit more than 100 years ago as a lighthouse. It's cool that they maintained the same aesthetic, not the color, but the same aesthetic with the mini garitas, mini sentries right up there. There's a very interesting bird over here. Let me know if you recognize it. Ooh, it's doing a dive. Uh, is it windy because of Brett, the tropical storm? No, you know, this area of Puerto Rico is pretty windswept. If anyone knows more details about this wind, someone earlier asked about trade wind, so I don't know what type of wind it is, but it's definitely always windswept. 
So wind is always blowing in, in these parts. There's areas of the island where it's a little bit more calmer, and that's towards the south of the island, where it faces the Caribbean Sea. We're right now facing the Atlantic. Danette says, have you ever heard the song Balante about Puerto Rico? Oh, no. I've not heard the song Balante. I gotta check it out. Wow. Are you going to Ponce or Juana Diaz? Not this trip, Joe. I have work on Saturday. <laughs> By work, I mean uh, I'm doing the one of the live videos with Classic Harbor Line, and that was planned uh, many months ago. So I squeezed in the Puerto Rico trip between my live streams with Classic Harbor Line. However, I do aim to come back, and I will be showing you those Spanish, the Puerto Rican pastries that are very famous here, uh, coffee plantations are really talked about, haciendas. Maybe I would love to show where sugar was cultivated because I think that's a fascinating part of history as well. There's a lot of cool history parts here and I haven't had the chance to explore it this time around because I've mostly been in the metropolitan region. But yesterday I did venture out into the interior of the island. So you can check out that live video that I did with Tongo PR where we explored a Yunque and we also went to Loisa. What's the weather in January here like? I think the best time of year probably would be December and January for Puerto Rico because it's, it's, it's cooler. It's about 81 degrees Fahrenheit, 82 degrees Fahrenheit. The skies tend to be clearer during December and January. Uh, right now we're seeing a haziness and part of that haziness is due to the sand. A desert in Africa uh, which border Egypt and a whole host of other countries. The same sands of the Sahara that's famous in movies like The Mummy <laughs> or, uh, or countless other films about ancient Egypt. Yep, they reach all the way here every year. Uh, I th as far as I know, the sands of the Sahara, I think, are stronger during the summertime. Uh, don't quote me on that if anyone can find more information. But that, this haziness that you're seeing is the sands of the Sahara reaching in Puerto Rico. And Puerto Rico functions as like a massive L air purifier uh, for those sands. So they really don't reach Dominican Republic or Jamaica or Cuba as far as I know. So one caveat everyone, I am walking around uh, here on the whim spontaneously. This is what I do with live videos. They're not always planned, they're not always um, structured, and I don't have any notes or script with me. I just love to research things, but I don't always know everything exact with exact specificity. So do your own research after watching these live videos, or feel free to clarify in the comments. Nina says, is it humid? It is humid, but Today, it's a little bit less than yesterday. Ooh, a container ship. Look at that. Wow. All right, let me show you La Perla. La Perla is a very famous area of Puerto Rico. Infamous, more so. A uh, famous music video, Despacito, was filmed there. You probably heard it, it conquered the world for quite a while. I heard it in every country I visited a few years ago. Uh, John Claus says, yeah, the Saharan desert dust can reach Brazil and Mexico from time to time, depending on what, on wind. Okay, thank you so much. So La Pella, unfortunately La Pella is a low income area tucked in between the fortification walls of old San Juan and the sea. So it is vulnerable to any overflow of water, any high winds and things like that. But beyond that, the area also is a bit, uh, a bit of a, like a, a bit of a, like a territory where people have their own laws <laughs> in essence, like a mini favela. So unfortunately there is drug trade that happens there. Uh, there are cl nightclubs as well where you probably find more illicit drugs, things like that. 
though it has increasingly become a tourist spot it used to not be the case every tourist guy would tell you to avoid it back in the day i remember remember as a little kid uh, i was always told don't never venture into la perla which the camera's facing you see some of those uh, colorful houses uh, but now due to that despacito music video and a few other things that have been happening there uh, and more like nightclubs and bars and restaurants up opening up there people have been visiting it more but it's still a dangerous place to visit and i would not recommend it uh, unless if you're going during the daytime and with a group of friends just maybe to see the murals john claus says it's a slum no problem with saying that yes low-income housing it's a slum yeah favela is a, is a i think a more specific word John Claus says, yeah, you can go in, but you need to behave and follow instructions. Yeah, the locals there don't, don't like anyone filming. We're taking photographs of people. Hey, Roxanne says, good day, Ariel. Hey, Roxanne, thank you so much for tuning in. Roxanne, leaving a five dollar super chat tonight thank you so much roxanne that is so every ten dollars is 1.3 pina coladas so this is i gotta do some math now so 13 divided by two what's 13 divided by two 12 divided by two would be six about seven okay so it's about 0.725 pina coladas thank you so much give or take no a little bit less 0 0.65 0 0.625 pina coladas thank you so much roxanne Sorry, I said 0.65. Uh, yeah, 0.65 pina coladas, yeah. So here the cannons would have been aiming directly at those damn Americans <laughs> in the USS Iowa. Well, unfortunately, the Spanish Empire, when uh, the Americans invaded, was already a dying empire. They were holding on to these last few colonies after Simón Bolívar and a whole host of other rebellions and revolutions happened in South America and Central America. The Spaniards really couldn't match too much the firepower of the Americans. Battles were fairly quick. A guest here today. We have Ignacio the Iguana, Ignatius the Iguana, right over here. Chilling under the sun. Everyone say hello to Ignatius or Ignacio in Spanish. Nina says, Will you be avoiding the yeah, I don't think a I don't think it will be a hurricane. It seems to be just a tropical storm, and it seems like it's not really heading to Puerto Rico anymore. Uh, but nonetheless, I am leaving Friday, so I won't be encountering it. Leslie says you are the guest. He lives there off the tourist food. Uh, Ron says, can you tell Ign Ignacio how his friend tasted? <laughs> No comment, no comment. For anyone who wants to know, yesterday I had a empanadilla de iguana. Uh, literally a pastry, meat pastry of, uh, iguana meat pastry. It was really good. It was actually very interesting.
Roxanne says, are you heading to New York? Yeah, I'm going back. 24th, I'll be live at 10.30 a.m. Uh, from Classic Harbor Line Channel. We're going on a sailboat. Owen, nice to see you here. Kay says, does he know that you ate his relative yesterday? No, I don't think, uh, I don't think we should tell Ignacio the Iguana. Susie says, your voice sounds different, Ariel. You must be tired. You'll be seeing a uh, short video soon, but yesterday, last night, I went on a bar crawl with a girl. Doom says, what is the sunglasses called? Ah, uh, I forgot the name of the model, but these are from Warby Parker. And I think they're still selling them. Warby Parker. Richard says, I love watching all your adventures. So Meta says, buffering. So yes, as, as uh, Susie has observed, my voice is a bit hoarse uh, because yesterday I went on a bar crawl through Old San Juan with an amazing content creator by the name of Pablo. He runs an Instagram called Whiskey Rican. And we hopped from we hopped from some of the most famous bars in the world, La Factoria, and we went to a few other bars. We, we saw uh, distillery of rum and got to taste rum directly from the cask uh, it was really cool experience so a lot of drinks cocktails rum cigars and also food was involved it was a long epic night and you will be seeing a short video about it soon really cool guy appreciated his hospitality for showing me those bars uh, met a friend of his and also uh, got to meet uh, owner of a distillery and got to meet a uh, random Japanese man who is a DJ and cooks food here in Puerto Rico um, for some reason. So it was a very interesting night. Isa says what? <laughs> Yep, very interesting night. Met some very interesting characters. Uh, yeah. Okay, so it sounds like a good night, yeah. So it's going to be hard service-wise to go into this area. So I'm going to stick to the outer perimeter. Also to show you the interiors kind of sucks. The service is not good. Pretty much still, right now it's bare bones, but these were a lot of barracks, uh, places where they held arms, gunpowder, gun things like that. And Marie says, did you go to Bacardi or Badialito? Badialito. I went to Badialito. That was the rum distillery I visited. Actually, no, sorry. I did, I did try Badialito. I did not go to the distillery. Uh, but I did try Badialito, it was really good rum. But the uh, distillery I went to was called Scryer. So it's a Irish American distilled rum who hired a well known Japanese DJ who became a cook.
Hey, Robert. Robert just purchased my essential guide to New York City. Hey, Robert, I do appreciate it. Thank you so much for buying the essential guide to New York City. So if people don't know, I have a really, really in-depth guide to New York that's all digital. Uh, and you can see maps integrated into it, all videos of those locations linked inside the guide. So you can also see videos of these places that I mentioned. I cover best brunch places, best places to eat, uh, best pizza. I have a really in-depth pizza guide. If you want traditional New York pizza, or you want to try new interesting uh, experimental pizzas. I have um, the best museums, how to visit the museums, where to go in New York City, what neighborhoods to visit, uh, how to get from the airport to the city. I have a whole host of guides, how to do transportation. I know a lot of people are watching from Europe, uh, I cover tipping, I cover uh, etiquette in restaurants that differ from European restaurant etiquette uh, and all those other basic things in culture, food, and attractions. Urbanist.live slash guide. Isa says, enjoy hermano, be safe. Barrelito gives uh, good tours in Bayamón. Glad you like this, says Anne-Marie. Oh, that's cool that everybody you moan. Yep, I just gotta come here for a longer time. So yeah, here's a gorgeous garita, another one. Oh, is your dad with you also, Isa? Uh, my, my dad, my parents are both in Puerto Rico at the moment. I will be seeing them later uh, in the evening. But no, at the moment I'm on my own. But yes, my, my parents uh, are indeed here. And I will be uh, visiting more family members later tonight. Does the, does the garita smell bad? Well, we will investigate uh, after these photos. Let me know in the comments if you want me to show anything in particular in terms of zooming in. Someone said go left. Fortunately, I can't really go inside uh, the, the actual fort because there's no reception. You can see some modern extensions, modern renovations here. Well, modern meaning maybe a hundred years ago, maybe a little bit less. Robert says, I hope it's okay. Uh, post the price. Yes, it's $19.99, $20 uh, for the guide. And Nice. Pick your elders for more knowledge, says Isa. Yeah, of course. I got to meet uh, 99, my 99-year-old granduncle yesterday, the day, bef the day before yesterday, and it was amazing. Uh, really sharp. Gave me some good insights. Said to live on the path of God. It was very nice. Very straightforward. And hello, Joe and Susie. Hello. Everyone, good evening, says Eugene. What type of food does the Japanese DJ cook in Puerto Rico? This bar is called Scryer. In the rooftop, you'll find the Japanese cook. Um, and he cooks uh, classic Kyoto street food. And it really does, I haven't been to Kyoto, but I've tried Japanese food in New York. And it tastes like, just like great, well-made Japanese food. Uh, here in the middle of Puerto Rico, which is very interesting. Okay, yeah, right here. So we got the flag of the United States of America, 50 states, 50 SARS. Puerto Rico, right over here in the middle. And the Cross of Burgundy, which was associated with the Spanish Empire for the duration that they were in control of Puerto Rico under their empire. Java asks, why is Puerto Rico not a state, but rather a territory? That's a very complicated question. Very complicated question. It is a very heated topic that I hesitate to even uh, talk about, but to not get into personal preferences or the politics that are going in right now, Let's make a direct comparison between Puerto Rico and Hawaii. Hawaii was acquired uh, around the same time in Puerto Rico, maybe a few decades afterwards. Let me know when Hawaii was acquired by the Americans. Uh, it was um, more so of a business coup 
uh, to take over Hawaii because a group of businessmen that were based in Hawaii, American businessmen, uh, decided to hold a coup d'etat, imprison the queen of Hawaii at the time, and basically urge the Americans to intervene and help with this coup d'etat. So the Americans took over Hawaii. And then the Americans also took over Puerto Rico. The thing is, Hawaii of Hawaiians. So Hawaii quickly became assimilated into American culture. Uh, so there was bad reception. So Hawaii was Hawaii assimilated much quicker into American culture. Americans were indeed heavy-handed. They did uh, ban the Hawaiian language. They did not allow really Hawaiian history to be taught. Uh, there was no Hawaiian flag. It, it, indeed, the Americans were heavy-handed in making the culture disappear. But since it was much farther away in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, and the fact that Americans went in there in droves and converted the culture fairly quickly, Hawaii was able to be... Americans accepted Hawaii to become a state by, what was it, 1950 or so, after World War II. Uh, it was in America's interest to keep Hawaii as a territory during World War II because it was a perfect launching point, militarily speaking, into the Pacific to defeat the Japanese. So Americans needed Hawaii. If we didn't have Hawaii, um, I think America might have had a tougher time during World War II. It would have been a, a much longer battle during World War II. So uh, it was in America's interest to keep Hawaii because by the 1950s, of course, the Soviets were also on the other side of the Pacific. So just in case war broke out, it was efficient and optimal to have territory and then later a state close, closer to the Soviets and potentially the Soviet's con or communist revolutions or Soviet-friendly states in Indonesia and other parts of that area of the South Pacific. So that said, that's why I think uh, Hawaii became a state fairly quickly. It was due to the rapid assimilation into American culture and the extreme need after World War II for the Americans to hold that territory. Puerto Rico was a bit different. Um, it finally, to trying to assimilate a million plus, I forgot the exact number of the population at that time in the 50s or so, uh, a million plus people into American culture, it would have been very difficult. Uh, Americans would have had to be very heavy handed in doing so. Um, so that didn't happen. And I think that's why Puerto Rico has kind of just lingered in this kind of uh, limbo state uh, between a what would be a state or full independence. It's kind of there lingering in the middle because both really haven't, haven't been viable for America. And if the Civil War is any lesson that we can learn, if you tip... You can run into issues. Uh, America kind of has a fine balancing act between different two major different political uh, beliefs and ways of governance. And it does it really well, and it's done it well in the past few hundred years, but the Civil War was a rocky point because the balance of power was being tipped due to new states being added. That could happen with Puerto Rico. So in American political interest, having Puerto Rico as a state might not be in the best interest for a portion of Americans, at least from their point of view. From Puerto Ricans' point of view, that's also a different story. And then full independence for Puerto Rico, it would be tough. And then America, I'm not sure if has much military interest anymore in Puerto Rico, since there's not much of a naval threat from a European power, uh, like Germany back in World War I and then later World War II. Uh, there's not really a threat from too much nuclear weapons being hosted in the nearby country like was the case in the Cold War. So I'm not sure if Amer Americans really don't have any more military interests in the island. 
But there is still interest in having this gateway to the Caribbean nonetheless. So it's a complicated matter, but that's, that's my way of kind of thinking of why Puerto Rico isn't either fully independent or a state. And also we have to take into consideration other major global powers like China, like a growing, rapidly growing Brazil. Um, I think there's some American interest in not wanting a Puerto Rico to go into the hands or under the influence of those two powers. Politics is never clear cut. Geopolitics is never clear cut. It is very complicated. Uh, it's not always just a question of culture and uh, keeping a way of life, but sometimes there's much bigger forces at play. So, yeah, very interesting topic. Joe says, many want independence, many want to remain a commonwealth. Yes. yes. And then you have the huge Puerto Rican dis diaspora, uh, 8 million plus Puerto Ricans in America, uh, which complicates things further. Hey, Henry says, I have to go. If anyone here is interested in Old San Juan, you're uh, welcome to a modal reenactment by the group uh, belonging to the Ligimento Fijo de Puerto Rico. Uh, we fire cannons. That is awesome. That is awesome. I would love to find out when you do that. Maybe next time I come here, I will see that reignitement. Maybe I'll film it live uh, with permission, of course, uh, because that would be wonderful. So Anne Marie has a great pro tip for anyone coming here to Puerto Rico to check out the reenactments of uh, of the Spanish-American War, of the British invasion back in 1598, of the Dutch as well, uh, and the various other battles that happened under the Spanish. You get into murky waters. Petrin says, you're getting to murky waters, brainstorming about Puerto Rico being a state. I think it's very important to, to think about history critically and to not just avoid a certain topic because it's too sensitive or too... There's a lot of emotion in these topics and this, this happens all around the world. I've encountered similar topics in Europe, similar topics in Mexico, similar topics in the US. This, this happens all around the world. And there's a lot of emotion when it comes to these topics, but I think if we get too afraid of having just a neutral, historical, critical conversation about it, uh, we can learn more. We don't need to necessarily come make sense of things uh, and think about critically in a way that uh, illuminates as to why the situation is happening in the first place. I think that's very important, very important. That's why I love history. Uh, that's why I will continue talking about history and all aspects of history. Uh, and that's why I avoid talking about politics because politics usually is weighed down by the emotion, which is okay, it's natural, it's, it's acceptable. But I'd rather stick to more of the, the historical end, uh, even if it teeters on these topics, because it's important to be curious about our world, about how it's run about the forces at play, from the very small to the very big, from the micro-economical to the huge global economical forces. I think very important. And another thing is sometimes I encounter this in other countries as well, uh, but I am sure I'll counter this in Puerto Rico. People might say, but you, you live in New York. You can't talk about this. You have no right to say anything about it. I have a right to talk about any aspect of history I want to. <laughs> and anyone does too. Feel free to chat about any aspect of history. Of course, we, we're, we're not here to offend anyone. We're not here to uh, stir something. I'm not here to do a coup d'etat. I think most people are not. <laughs> I 
Uh, but I think it's okay to talk about any aspect of history, even if it's not your own culture, your own place of residence, um, or your own heritage or blood or whatnot. It's okay to talk about any aspect of history uh, or any aspect of uh, geoeconomics or military or whatnot. It's, I think it's wonderful. All right, let's see what else we can uh, check out. Let's see if we can check out the middle. Ron says, can you please cover the history behind that iguana? Is the garita open yet? <laughs> John Claus says, siempre hay uno. <laughs> There's always one guy saying, don't talk about that stuff. Puerto Rico es muy chévere. Thank you for these uh, videos. Yeah, my pleasure. All right, so I'm kind of lingering here to show you uh, this century. So let's wait. No worries. Wow. So this one does not smell. Uh, it smells like sea salt. <laughs> no, no other smells, luckily. But it's pretty clean. But it definitely smells like sea salt. All the years of being swept by the ocean winds. That's really cool. So imagine being here back in the day, seeing all those ships come in, pirates, Dutch, Germans, uh, because Germans also went to like Venezuela for a little bit other ethnicities of uh, other Latin American countries probably had ships passing by at some point. Brazilians, uh, Spaniards, Portuguese, the British, the Scottish, when they tried to take part of Panama and failed and bankrupted their own country, leading it to join the UK. All these powers and nationalities and empires coming through these waters, passing by, they're docking over for trade or trying to conquer it or uh, doing business or pirating, trying to take these, the goods of these ships and sell it elsewhere. So much has happened here on these waters. Imagine all the history this little slit in the sentry box has seen. One can only imagine. I wish I could make like a video, just like an animation of all the history passing through this little slit of history.
Is there any history of Germans in Puerto Rico? The Germans had plans to invade the Caribbean in general uh, before the events of World War I. So around the late 18, around the 1890s, uh, that was never, they never officially launched any plans. They never actually followed through. Uh, but then there was German immigration that came over here. A lot of them went to the modern day of area of San Dulce. And I'm not sure if there's other areas where Germans mostly went to, but still to this day, some Puerto Ricans have German names or uh, German name, names that were made more into Spanish language. Accessibility. I think there might be a ramp. Judging by the accessibility of the bathrooms, there are probably ramps that you can come into the main entrance, uh, which is great. Various stairways that would lead to other parts. All right, everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. We just went all around the perimeter of the modern day Morro. The Morro is much smaller than the entire perimeter of old San Juan. But due to modernization and the need to provide traffic flow and the expansion of the old city, so more people can move in, several sections were destroyed. But today it's well worth coming to a Morro, so I highly, highly recommend it, everyone. No bomba performances around, says Isa. I randomly saw bomba being performed at a bar in El Vijo San Juan. I'm sure you can find bomba. Bomba is one of the traditional musics performed here in Puerto Rico, uh, from originally from Africa, derived from the Yoruba in Africa, and other similar African tribes from that region who came over here, who were brought over here against their will. So everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. I do appreciate it. This is El Morro here in El Viejo San Juan, Old San Juan. It is walking distance from Old San Juan. It's right here. It's only a five minute uh, walk away, which you saw the other day. And I highly recommend coming here. Uh, if you're staying in El Condado, Isla Verde, it's still fairly close as well. And um, you can easily get here via Uber. Uber is very easy to use now in Puerto Rico. Uh, it, you, it might be a wait, because I tried to check Uber the other day. Maybe a 15 minute wait to go to other parts of the metropo metropolitan region. But it is doable and it's not that expensive. Way cheaper than New York City. Way, way cheaper. Uh, for example, here to further into the metropolitan area, um, costs about like $20 or so. I assume for my condado or one of the resorts, it's not that much money, uh, which is nice. So highly recommend coming here to Morro. You're going to have a blast. $10 uh, entrance fee. And it's worth every single little penny. Let me know if you want me to return to Puerto Rico at some point to show you other parts outside of Viejo San Juan here. If you want to see more of the history of Morro, I did cover it before. Search. Puerto Rico Urbanist, and you'll see the video pop up. It's on the Urbanist Bonus channel on YouTube. And that bonus channel is where I post really old videos that I published 2019 and before. So you can check that out. Everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. See you on the 24th on the Classic Harbor Line channel. I'll be live at 10.30 a.m. sailing along the Hudson. Oh yes, it's gonna be a lot of fun. Keep being awesome and always keep on exploring. Y quédate curiosos, mis amigos. Y amigas, adiós, todo el mundo viendo allá, todo urbanistas, que tengan buen día.